Welcome to the SPS Digital Learning Hour. Brought to you by the Digital Learning and Assessment Department. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Mike Thomas. And I'm Suzanne Zargis. We're coming to you from a conference room in Central Office, bringing you the latest news in the Springfield Public Schools in regards to technology, along with inspiring interviews from teachers who are using technology in the classroom. We'll also inform you of the latest updates, practices, and news as it pertains to our district. Whether you are new to using technology in the classroom or are a seasoned vet, we are here to help. Thanks for joining us today. I'm your host, Mike Thomas, and I am so glad to be with you. In case you missed it, the latest blog post is out and it talks all about game-based learning. I know last week we mentioned gamification and what that looks like in the classroom. This week, we thought it was a good idea to talk about what game-based learning looks like in the classroom. Maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. Either way, you should check out the latest blog post. In case you missed it, we've started doing teacher spotlights and we've been lucky enough for the last couple of podcasts to actually have the person who was the teacher spotlight interview. So if you're interested in going out and looking and seeing the teacher spotlight, check it out. In case you missed it, instead of We Learn Symposium, we are moving to a new format for the spring called We Learn Wednesdays. Essentially what that means is we're going to be at the Melanie Kess Prison Center and we will have different sessions running on three out of the four Wednesdays in March. So go out to my learning plan to sign up. Check it out. It's going to be super exciting. That's it for In Case You Missed It. Coming up next, Hot Takes. So as you can tell, normally during In Case You Missed It, you hear multiple voices. Instead, you got me again. We are all running around like crazy during MCAS and trying to help schools prepare for that. So you get just me, which is great for me because I enjoy doing this quite a bit. Today, I actually wanted to talk about something I learned about recently. The Office of Education Technology. There's a website for that. This is a government site. This is tech.ed.gov. So this website, the Office of Education Technology, and I didn't really know much about it until I started exploring the website. So many great articles on here. And one that I wanted to talk about today was all about this idea of personalized learning. And you're like, yay, personalized learning. I know what that is. I wonder what he has to say about it. Well, I don't know if you know a lot about personalized learning. I realize that's what my definition is, is only one of a few of what people talk about when they think about personalized learning. And a lot of times personalized learning is that term is used interchangeably with a few others like adaptive learning, blended learning, competency, competency based learning, differentiated learning, individualized learning. Those are a lot of terms and they all can't mean the same thing or else we would just have one term. And so I think it's kind of important. This article actually talks about this too, about like what is each one of these terms and what are they and how do they overlap? And so I'm going to give you a few of them. Adaptive learning is technology used to assign human or digital resources to learners based upon their unique needs. All right. That sounds, makes sense. Individualized learning. The pace of learning is adjusted to meet the needs of individual students. So notice it's not about the technology, but that one is more about how fast the students are moving through it. If students are advancing quickly or if they need to slow down, what they're doing slows down with them and it becomes more individualized. Differentiated learning is the approach to learning is adjusted to meet the needs of individual students. So if I'm teaching a lesson, for example, all about Christopher Columbus and I have readings that I want the students to do, one way that I would differentiate is use something like Rewordify, put the reading in there, and then the students can have it at their reading level. So that's just one way to differentiate. That one you're probably the most familiar with. Another one is competency-based learning. Learners advance through a learning pathway based on their ability to demonstrate competency, including the application and creation of knowledge along with skills and dispositions. Now that one is a huge, it's just another way that students are learning, but it's based on a path that is created for them, a path of learning, and that they have to prove that they've mastered something before it moves on. A lot of times we hear competency-based learning and mastery learning. That one is interchangeable, and I think that one is probably more accurate. So each of these we think of when we think of personalized learning. So it's important to 
understand what personalized learning is, because if it's all of those things, then the definition needs to be a bit bigger. It's important to realize that personalized learning entails more than just the definition. It entails school culture, the pedagogy, curricular choices, and available resources which influence the shape of personalized learning in any given learning environment. In kind of helping with the understanding of personalized learning, the 2016 National Education Technology Plan kind of gave a definition for it. And here's our definition. Let me know what you think in the Yammer comments. Personalized learning refers to instruction in which the pace of learning and instructional approach are optimized for the needs of each learner. Learning objectives, instructional approaches, and instructional content and its sequencing may all vary based on learners' needs. In addition, learning activities are made available that are meaningful and relevant to learners, driven by their interests and often self-initiated. Ooh, that... It's a lot there. With that definition, along with those other ones, there's a few things that kind of emerge that are similar. There's the pace of learning is adjusted. It means not everybody's going through at the same speed. The objectives, approaches, and content and tools are tailored to each learner. If I have a student who is so ready to learn to read, but then you give them a a type of story that they're not interested in, it's going to stunt that growth. Learning is driven by those learners' interests. Even in that dev example I was just giving for the other point, it was kind of that same thing where it's like, if they're interested about it, they will learn. Learners are given choice in what, how, when, and where they learn. So it's not just tethered to a desk in a classroom in a lecture. While some of us learn well that way, that is not everybody's learning style. And technology supports what they're doing. It doesn't hinder it. It allows that personalization to happen. What's interesting with this particular article that I was reading here is that after that definition, other people felt like they had to chime in and give even more definitions. There's the U.S. Department of Education's 2016 National Education Technology Plan and 2017 NEPT update, where they go through their definition, the District Reform Support Network, so District RSN. It's an organization formed to offer technical assistance and resources to race to the top districts, gives their definition. The Friday Institute of Education Innovation at NC State gives theirs. There's the Digital Promise, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, and Educase. International Association, Rhode Island Personalized Learning Initiative, Alliance for Excellent Education, LEP, or I'm sorry, not LEP, LEAP Learning Framework for Personalized Learning, Great School Partnership, Personalized Learning in Action. All of these different groups of people have decided that they need to give a definition of personalized learning. And I'm not going to stay here and read them all to you. You get bored and be like, why didn't you just give me the article? Well, the article's in the show notes if you want to read it. But essentially, as I was reading each one of these, I'm like, well, they all kind of sound the same with the same language. It's all about learning experiences and instructional approaches and academic support across the district. Learning needs, interest, aspiration, background is included in some of them. And so while defining all of these definitions of personalized learning, it doesn't really help us with like how to actually do it. And a lot of times when we think of personalized learning, we think of those websites who do part of it or those programs that do a part of it where they give students what they call personalized learning, but it's really more of either adaptive learning or depending on how involved teachers are with the software that they're using, it's differentiated learning, it's individualized learning, but it's less on the teacher making the choices, more on the students. Those are the kind of softwares that we're used to right now. But that's just a part of personalized learning. So if we're wanting to figure out how this all works together, a few things that we can remember is all learners need to be engaged in a tailored learning experience, which can include 
the teacher-led part, a whole class, small group activities, learners working in groups or individually, and, and, and learners engaged in digital learning activities. Every, every step along the way, learners' performance is measured. So there's got to be some sort of open-ended probing questions, assessment type deal to it. Each learner's performance data is interpreted against established criteria. So you can't just start doing personalized learning without having some sort of place to start from. Like we need measures for skills like problem solving and critical thinking. This is where that area can come in. Learning experiences are personalized for each learner based on the data. Now there's a few schools out there, a few school districts that pay hundreds of thousands of dollars so that every day the student's learning is based upon data from the day before. That's a lot of work. I know it's a few schools in New York. I, the name of the program is just escaping me right now. Um, but what they do is they take that data and they completely change the next day, which can be hard on the teacher and really hard on students. Because if they're having this data come in about things that they need or things that they know, and then they turn around and take that to apply it to new learning for the future, what it doesn't take into account to what they're currently learning. And a lot of times it takes repetition for us to understand how to do something. I can watch a video on how to change a tire on my car. I could watch a person change the tire on my car. I could attempt to change the tire on my car and I could do it again and I can do it again and I can do it again. And by through that repetition, then I understand how it works. That's what I had to do when I was in high school. I was part of the requirement for driver's ed is we had to learn how to change tires in case of an emergency, which makes sense. With mathematics, it's the same thing. You don't do the Pythagorean theorem once and be like, oh, I got it. You don't watch a video, solve one problem and say, oh, I can do it. But you really take that learning and then you practice, practice, practice until you can prove it through some sort of open-ended question. It goes back to that idea when we're thinking about competency-based learning, where we're mastering a skill, mastering something, and then being able to move on. I feel like in some of these, some of these examples that they were giving, like students with that constant change, they don't have time to master. They don't have time to practice. At least that's how the article was portraying it. I am not in those schools. Clearly, I'm with you. Um, so I don't know exactly what that looks like. Um, a couple of these other personalized learning... Uh, things is that success needs to continue to be measured. Performance needs to be measured again and again and again. That's one of the reasons why I think we do not just our district assessments, but those ANET assessments so that we get that repetition in. And with the ANET in particular, what they do is they take some of the old skills that they have supposedly mastered, apply them in with the new skills, which they have supposedly learned so that they can show their growth and show their learning. So personalized learning, it can be challenging in understanding what it is because there's just so many definitions out there and so many ways to go about it. But then I come back to when I think about a few of the interviews I've done where teachers have talked about why they do what they do. Like, why am I going to do it? And is it going to help my students? So in thinking about personalized learning, we have to ask ourselves, why should I do it? And well, here are some thoughts on that, on why you should be doing it and some potential benefits. So when the pace of learning is adjusted for each learner, all learners have the time they need to demonstrate mastery. When learning is optimized and tailored for each learner and driven by learner interest, it's more meaningful and relevant, which can lead to a greater engagement. When learners are given more choices, they take ownership over their learning. And that is huge, that ownership. When learning is supported by technology, learners can receive more frequent and immediate feedback through formative assessment, quizzes, checks for understanding, with results provided to teachers and learners in real time. When the right tools, learning gaps that impede progress can be identified more quickly, allowing learners to close those gaps. So with using certain tools, it allows you to identify where the weaker aspects of that student's learning is, where you can then turn around and go and help and give them what they need. And technology allows us to tailor the instruction to individuals, which gives more targeted attention to learners who are struggling or progressing more rapidly than their peers, rather than being forced to, as it's termed, teaching to the middle. Like you have your high kids, you have your low kids, but you spend most of your time on that middle group. By 
with personalized learning, you can teach those high kids where they're at. You can teach those low kids where they're at. You can teach that middle where that middle is. And then that middle spreads out even more because not everybody that's in the middle is kind of in that same boat. I remember having students who would be considered in the middle. And when it came to fractions, they were at the higher end. But then those middle students, when it came to decimals, became the lower end. By being able to tailor what you're doing, and if I were teaching now and tailoring more what I was doing, those kids in the middle who fluctuate up and down, they can get the targeted instruction that they need through the use of different tools, different personnel in the classroom. And technology can help with all the resources. It can also help with building a stronger connection to their work and also to each other. Because if they are collaborating using the tools, they can work together. They can solve problems together, which will help them just bond a little bit more. I know I've had years when I was teaching where the class was very disjointed, where many students didn't get along. I had other years where it was utopia in the classroom, where I could do all these grand things teaching because everybody got along and I didn't have to worry about those interpersonal skills. Those interpersonal skills come when the students can work together. If they are having trouble working together, then those skills get stunted and the growth of their abilities get stunted because they're not able to work together. Do you follow? And then another advantage with personalized learning is that every single person in your classroom, every single student in this district has a different background. There, there might be similar aspects to each of their backgrounds, but it is different. I was recently listening to Ken, Sir Ken Robinson. He's got a thing on Netflix called Finding Your Element. We were, I was recently watching that, and this just came to mind as I was reading this, is that that whole idea of walking a mile in someone's shoe is extremely difficult because every shoe is different. He asked the audience this question with how many people were truly something like just trying to get to the point where everybody is different. In human history, the number of people who have been alive is a humongous number, somewhere around 100 billion or something. But the idea is that that is 100 billion different people living. That's 100 different billion lives. While that number is huge to think about, the 20 students you have in front of you, that is 20 different students with different aspirations, different skills, different goals, different growth mindsets, different. They are different. And anytime we try to funnel our teaching down the middle or what we think is down the middle, we really miss out on the intricacies of each person. So by being able to tailor the learning environment where you have an overarching goal, an overarching standard that you're trying to cover, some sort of larger objective, but how the students get there is their path. That comes back to like, it makes me even think of the SAMR model of like, when you're assigning students work, you can have students read a book, but then they have to do some sort of report on it. That report can be anything from an actual book report to a video to a reenactment of a scene from the story. Something that shows their understanding of the story and the main points. They could do a panel interview. They could Skype in, try to attempt to Skype in with the author so that they could talk to the author and have the author answer questions about that book and then report back on that. There's just so many different ways to present information and to show your learning that it really can be individualized. And kind of wrapping up this idea of personalized learning, there's a lot of different definitions out there. I think one of the things we need to do and we need to remember is to kind of come together with one definition of what that looks like and then how we do that and then why it's important. Personalized learning is to deliver it on its promise. Then those who implement these systems need to measure and optimize these impacts side by side with learning outcomes. Our approach to personalized learning needs to reflect both our aspirations and our values. For this week's interview, I spent time with Sean Kavanaugh of Central High School and talking about how he is integrating technology and the different tools that he is using within his classroom. So take a listen. My name is 
Sean Kavanaugh. I uh, teach social studies at Central High School. I've been here for nine years, and um, you know, I'm very happy to work here. Enjoy it very much. So in your total time of nine years, that would put us way before we had a learning management system, way before we had the one-to-one -one initiative. So what was technology like for you? I feel like in the beginning, I had some desktops in the classroom, maybe like three or four, that I tried to do some things with groups, but it was you know, very much kind of experimental and you know, nothing I ever depended on or really tried to use to augment the, the learning and the lessons. I've been hearing a lot of that from people who have been in the district for a while. That's, did you have a smart board at least or a projector or were you still with the vis-a-vis -vis and the colorful arms? I remember in, right in the beginning there was a classroom or two that I remember using transparencies in, which like that seems so long ago now, but, but, it, but that was you know, how I had to do it. A few classrooms might have had smart boards, but even then, you know, sometimes different components of it would be mm -hmm. not plugged in or, um, or maybe you just get a display. It was, you know, it was kind of haphazard, I guess would be the best way to put it. So would you say early on technology was not a key part of any of the stuff that you did in the classroom? No, it definitely wasn't a key thing. And even when I was you know, taking education courses, it was kind of like, they're like, yeah, you know, you can find some things and bring in online resources. But even then, it, was, it wasn't really modifying any pedagogy. It was kind of just looking at something that, that maybe you could have gotten a library before, but now you can get in the classroom. Right. So a lot of substitution. Mm -hmm. So take us to when you first started to really integrate technology into the classroom. What were some of those first things that you really tried? One of the first things was Twitter, um, which I think was helpful, but also there was a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make a joke there, but... Um, you would kind of, I would kind of get some things from class people who follow my uh, students, and it was just turned into like this big mess. And right around the time that I was deciding Twitter wasn't really working out for kind of keeping track of things, because again, with students, that's when I had first heard of like Edmodo and Schoology, um, kind of moved towards those. Um, but even then, I, I think it was for the first couple of years like more of like a novelty, like mm -hmm. we can organize here, but um, you know, we, we were just starting to get laptop cards in the classes and. You didn't always know if you could get them or if you have enough. So it was very much kind of a guessing game and without the ability to depend, or not depend, that, without the ability to to, um, to guarantee that you'd kind of have mm -hmm. the access the way you wanted. It was still like secondary, I guess, So to, to you know, in the structure of the lesson. Right. So you mentioned Edmodo and Schoolology. Those are both learning management systems. With your first interactions with those, what are some of the things that you really liked about it? What were some of the things that you were kind of like, ah, oh, that's not for me? I think... The way assignments could be you know, registered and turned in and like kept track of and very like very straightforward for an organization sense, I think was like not only helpful for me as a teacher but even for students to kind of just see plain as a day like did I do that or mm -hmm. not you know it's like kind of like a check mark there or not and, and I mean that's like super common for learning management systems now. I think that was really helpful, but at some point I forget which one of the two basically had a wall just like Facebook and again just turned into this kind of noise thing and someone would just say hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which is nice but <laughs> i remember when i first started using lms's it was edmodo and i think that's the one that you're talking about where it has like the facebook like wall yeah where as a teacher i teaching fifth graders i'd have to sit there and all right hi delete 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 delete, yeah. delete and it just got kind of annoying yeah but it's it's come full circle in a strange way uh because i definitely kind of use discussions and encourage the students to kind of interact with each other and i never really had to police them um for maybe like of the last five years where I was doing it pretty successfully, I think, they'd kind of be very um, cordial and respectful and interact in a very positive manner. And I've kind of seen this turn towards like like the Reddit mm -hmm. kind of, oh, your grammar's wrong. And, you know, some <laughs> students can be really hard on each other. Uh, so it's like become, you know, like this this brand new concept is kind of come, in the classroom has kind of come to mimic even some of the, the you know downsides of, you know, the adult inter internet mm -hmm. interactions and you know, feedback between people. Right. So that takes us to those learning management systems. Have you tried using Brightspace at all? I have, and, and I, I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. Uh, I've kind of been in this limbo. So when this, when Springfield was still kind of piloting different ones and they kind of wanted us, you know, see what's good, see what you like, I really got hooked on Canvas, and mm -hmm. I built a lot into it. And uh, at this point, they're supposed to be able to export and import between the two, but there's been some hitch, so I've kind of been still using it. Um, mm -hmm. I try to incorporate Brightspace. I think I found that uh, the students are really comfortable with it. When I was kind of using both or... Uh, you know, when, when Brightspace first come out, when I say, okay, we're going to try something in Brightspace, uh, none of them were like, what, what's that? And like now I, I say go to Canvas, they're like, oh, don't you mean Brightspace? Like there, I mean, it would be easier certainly for mm -hmm. them. Um, 
I mean, there's a learning curve for any system, but but I think that uh, when I can transition to it, it'll, it'll be you know helpful for them. So because you're using Canvas and Brightspace kind of like interchangeably at some points, it mm -hmm. sounds like. What are some of the things about Canvas that you wish Brightspace had the ability to do? Other than, um, of course, import everything you already yeah. created and move it <laughs> yeah, over. That, that would be helpful. Um, I think Brightspace has come a long way since the district adopted it. And um, the ability to kind of make a unit uh, in like a you know, uh, ladder sense or like in a kind of tree sense as to mm -hmm. like what doors can open and what doors can close and how students can kind of progress through different activities. I think Brightspace has gotten a lot better, but I think it's still a little bit easier for me to do it. Canvas, mm -hmm. um, kind of, you know, the way restrictions and access works. Yeah. So with, because I don't know enough about Canvas, because when I, when I was in your position piloting, I stuck with Edmodo, mm -hmm. because that's what I knew. Yeah. And I, I mean, found it easy. And for what I needed it, for fifth grade, it completed my objectives. Yeah. So what is it about Canvas that you really like? I think it's, it's a very powerful tool, but you can make it as simple, as, you know, simple as you want it to be. And so I think it's it's easy to kind of have. I mean, for me, I, mm -hmm. I grew up really comfortable with computers. I had you know the internet at five, which you know for someone who's thirty two, that's <laughs> that's clear. You know, that mm -hmm. was pretty early. And um, so I was really comfortable with kind of you know, working different things, um, coding a little bit. Uh, I actually entered university as a computer science major and had a big change of heart <laughs> and became a history major. Um, but I was really comfortable with kind of using some of the you know backdoor stuff that might be a little less approachable for some people, but mm -hmm. it kind of gave me free reign to kind of structure it as I wanted it to be. And I never found it difficult, I guess. So it being powerful, I kind of just use as much of it as I could. Nice. We are in 2017. As you've mentioned before, you've been teaching for many years now. What are some of the things that you're looking forward to being able to do with technology? Knowing that I can depend on it more has become so important. And now that we have the initiative to have the Wi-Fi hotspots, um, because before, even if I wanted to do things that were kind of, you know, very web-based, um, very, you know, uh, mm -hmm. internet-based, you had to kind of bank in, uh, you know, we only have so much class time, students might be late, students might be absent, you know, weekends and all these things. So you kind of had to, you know, look at, you know, deadlines of how units have to be, how quarters have to be, mm -hmm. and, and really try to find ways to make it work. Whereas I think now, if we know that it's, if you know, something has to become homework, we know it should be available still. I think that's really helpful in knowing, you know, one-to-one -one is coming in mm -hmm. with with web access, I think, um, really opens the possibilities. Have you explored, knowing that all this is coming, have you started to explore, like, the flipped classroom model or the blended classroom model at all? Uh, I have. I mean, I, I've, I've read a bit, and my, my sister, she works in another district, but she's a technology coordinator, and we talk often about these things. And, and really, the, the colleagues here at Central, I can't say enough of. Um, you know, we share and, and we brainstorm and we kind of see what works and what doesn't. And uh, Brian Cusack and I, even you know, five, six years ago, were talking about you know, like what's what's working for you and what's not. And um, it's been really helpful. And, and I think that flip model can be very, very, very successful with um, you know, students who are quick to take the initiative and are curious. Um, I think for some others, you know, they, they kind of still need a lot of guidance and it's, it's hard to kind of let the, let the reins loose. But uh, I think that things are becoming much more accessible. Uh, than ever. Education is going to be much more accessible than ever. And us as teachers, you know, we can still be there to kind of steer students in the right direction no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and even in the, in the course creation and how you kind of lay things out, it's still, you know, still your kind of uh, project, I guess. You know, sometimes I, I feel like I'm um, Christoph in the Truman Show. <laughs> you know, when, when like my, my, my classroom, I'll have them you know, working on some sort of project or some activity. And if it's, you know, an individual part, it's like I can hear like a pin drop or something and it's like eerie, you know, and then, does anyone need mm -hmm. help? Yeah, sometimes they need it, but sometimes, right. you know, they just yeah, take we're it good. and go. We're good. Yeah. So we've been, talked a lot about students and, like, the everyday classroom use of technology. How have, how has technology helped you become a better teacher? I think it's uh, it's made me more accountable because, you know, when I open up Power School or when I open up Dale Mass, I, like, see in my face, you know, what have I not graded yet? <laughs> and, and students, too, right. you know, are, are very vigilant on these things, parents. And so I think that um, it, it brings a transparency to both sides, to you know, to the learner and, and the teacher. Uh, and so that's kind of kept me on my toes more, more maybe. I mean, I, I feel like it. I don't, you know. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and also um, with, you know, with some classes when they kind of really run with things and, and I take a look the day before, I can see, you know, what was, um, you know, what did they get? What, what, what did they knock out of the park? And maybe some other things that, you know, we need to spend. Like I, I can restructure the next lesson based on kind of the feedback that I'm getting that afternoon, that evening. So I, I think the you know, the downtime between you know kind of I guess like a you know summative assessment mm -hmm. or a formative assessment I'm sorry, and uh, using that to inform your your teaching, uh, 
turnarounds much more quick. Nice. Or more streamlined. Yeah, streamlined would be a good word for that. So the final question that I like to ask at all these interviews is, if you could stand in front of all the new hires in the district, um, every year they go through a process where they get talked at a lot. If you had the chance to give them some advice, what would that be? Honestly, I don't, you know, people transition into teaching, they come from different fields and bring in different skills. Um, I mean, they come from teacher preparation programs, things like that. But I kind of look at technology almost as the way people would look at like a foreign language. Like if this isn't something you do much, you're going to have to, you're going to have to jump right in. You're going to have to you know, go to Coursera and try out like an intro to programming course and you know, kind of learn to to speak this because I think that it's, you know, things have become so easy for us and we infiltrate our lives in so many different ways. We're kind of understanding how it works and be comfortable manipulating things is a whole other level. So I think that people who don't have a background where they're using much technology, much um, kind of web 2.0 things, want to play around with those things as much as possible because it, it's helpful. I, I think this is, you know, the world the students were born into is this world and it's, it's kind of how they see things and to engage with them, this is the best way to do it. It's fantastic. Well, thank you again for your time. I know it's very busy Monday morning after vacation and so again we thank you for the time so i've spent some time now with a few different high school teachers in interviewing them for the podcast and i'm constantly amazed at the different ways that they are using technology in their classroom now me i come from elementary fifth grade background so anytime i see what teachers are doing at the higher grades one it's encouraging because they're very similar to the things that i would be doing in the classroom And two, it's great because knowing that there's that continuity from when they leave me and then they move through middle school and then they get to high school that they are still learning and growing using technology in ways that they were doing back when they were with me in fifth grade. And so my hope is if any of my students ever listen to this, that they felt supported when they were using technology and that their teachers who had them were lucky enough to know that, hey, when his students were in fifth grade, they were using a learning management system. They were reading articles online. They were doing research and that they had that, those opportunities. And so hearing Sean and talk, uh, talking to him about the things that he's doing in his classroom was great. As we wrap up this week, I just want to again remind you about all the ways that you can listen to the podcast. I don't know how you're listening to it right now. Maybe you're using Yammer and listening to the links that are posted there. Maybe you are on Spreaker.com's website. If you are there or on iTunes, please leave us a review. Same with Stitcher. If you're on any one of those three, leave us a review. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know that you like it and that it's useful and helpful to you, especially the interview part where you get to hear about what other teachers are doing. So anytime you have something you want to say, you can always leave us feedback on Yammer. Um, We have a group set up there. I'm also pretty active on Yammer. You may have seen me in my, my headband Monday from my mutter days. So you can leave us comments there and feedback there. You could also email us at DLA support at Spring fieldpublicschools.com if you are interested in being interviewed and feel like that you are doing stuff in the classroom that you want to share with others i promise you that we will come out to you and interview you so that you can talk about what you're doing and hopefully inspire other teachers because that's the whole point of the podcast is to help inform and inspire each and every one of you out there who are listening to us so i hope that this has been a good time for you it's been a good time for me i've enjoyed my time that's it for this week i'm mike Thomas, and I will see you next week.